uh, I have a, uh, a, a few announcements before we do dive into the talks. We have six of them. Um, a reminder that our official conference hashtag on social media is hashtag C4L21. And uh, if you would like to join our Code for Lib Slack community, please go to codeforlib.org slash Slack. After filling out the form, if you didn't receive an invite immediately, please check your spam folder. Have you hit information overload? Have you hit that wall during the conference, uh, even on day two? Remember, if you need to take a break from the talks, the virtual quiet room on Whova has a variety of quieter, meditative and restorative activities to help you rest up for the next batch of talks. And these talks are recorded, so you can catch up on anything you might have missed during your break. You can find the virtual quiet room page under the logistics menu option in Whova. We have our community support squad or CSS here to assist the attendees. You can find their schedules and photos beneath the conduct and safety section of the website. The community support volunteers for the first half of today are Eric Petteplace, uh, that's P-H-E-T-T-E-23 -E on Slack, and Louisa Quasigrouch. And sorry if I messed up that uh, pronunciation. And the Slack is L-O-U-I-S-A. So without further ado, um, we're gonna enter right into our lightning talks. Um, each presenter has about six minutes. Um, if you haven't already signed up uh, for a lightning talk and are interested in participating, um, I, th I think that the, the fact that we have this opportunity to, to share uh, our knowledge um, without having to prepare much for a presentation is one of the nice features of the Code for Lib community. Um, after today's session, we also have slots available tomorrow, um, Wednesday at uh, 3 p.m. Eastern time and uh, Thursday, 1 10 p.m. Eastern time. Um, all of our talk, chat and Q&A will be in the same session listing in Whova. A little different from the talk blocks yesterday where we moved around from session to session. If you have a question for one of the presenters, please enter the presenter's first or last name then your question. They will be presenting live, they're here with us, so likely we will not be able to get to address the questions until their presentation is over. And uh, without further ado, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, Hector Correa, who will talk about Markly, a command, a, a command line utility to parse mark fields. Take it away, Hector. Thanks, Akira. Let me share my screen. So my name is Hector Correa. I work at Princeton University Library. And I'm gonna talk about this command line utility that I wrote to parse, parse uh, large mark files. This started because me being a developer and not a librarian, when I started working in libraries, I've heard people uh, look at bibliographic records like this. Uh, librarians tend to look at them more in this form, which is uh, the mark data behind the record. And this is really good. It has a lot of nuance information. And if you're a developer, you need to know a lot, a lot of the details of the record. And all, all that information is specified in Mark. So this is great. But when me as a developer, I got Mark data, it usually looks like this, right? And it's like, what, what is that? Well, that's a Mark file in binary. Or sometimes they come in XML, which is a little bit more readable, but it still is not the same as reading what the librarian was looking at, right? So what I've done is, done is I wrote a small utility that actually allows us to look on the terminal to mark file in this format. So let me show you what I mean. So I have several mark files here on my machine. This is one. So if I look at this file, it looks like this. But if we use it with this utility, mark the line, oops, file, we'll give it the same name, then it looks in a more readable way. Now, if you are, have a developer and you parse mark files regularly, you probably have utilities to do this. In Ruby, in Java, they, there are many libraries to do this. So this is just in case you need to parse a very large file to actually find a particular record or analyze something really, really quickly. 
uh, it works really well with very uh, large files. Let me show you, for example, this is a file that is almost 500 megs. So if I look at that file, and I'm gonna use it, run it through the less command in Linux, and you can see that I can actually start looking at the files right away. And there are several kind of quick options to do filtering, like maybe only one certain fields. And then I'm gonna put it to the less command so it doesn't continue scrolling forever. So you can see the records right away. You can do filtering. I only want records that somewhere have the word water. And again, somewhere in this record, the word water appears. So this has been useful for me to find out how many records we have with a particular field. They don't have a part or they don't have a given field in mark. And it works like it work any any uh, Linux utility will will work. So because it outputs text files. So let me do the big file that I have here. You can just do maybe I only want. certain field and so that's that's the data you can do grep because we're just generating a, a regular uh, text file and you can see the ids and then you can say well how many lines there were and then you know that there are ten thousand records in this in this file and maybe you want to find out how many of they have the or fish somewhere, and you have seven records. So that's the call of this utility. It allows you to parse mouse files quickly, and it has no dependencies. It's an executable that you can just download and run on your machine. These are the, this is where you can go and get the files. Uh, there's an executable for Linux, one for Macs, one for Windows. And if you're interested in the source code, you can also find it in here, it's written in Go. Uh, which is not quite popular in, in libraries, but it, it is very readable. And if you have any thoughts, questions, comments, feel free to contact me. And that's all I have. Thank you. I clicked, I clicked uh, turn off video instead of unmute. Uh, thank you for the great talk, Hector. Um, just as a reminder, um, if you have any questions for Hector or any of uh, the other presenters, please put them in the Q&A. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Matt Lincoln, uh, who will present on too many photos, not enough metadata, computer vision for similarity search in the archives. Take it away, Matt. All right, thanks so much. Um, so yeah, the longer title of this uh, is a project that we did uh, at Carnegie Mellon last summer uh, for Computer Aided Metadata for Photo Archives Initiative. Um, and this was a project that I worked on with uh, our wonderful university archivist, uh, Julia Corrin and Emily Davis, uh, and another one of our former colleagues, Scott Weingart. Um, but yes, as the short title is, uh, too many photos, not enough metadata. And I'm gonna be completely stealing from Andromeda Yelton kind of this entire short talk. So uh, the problem that we were facing here at CMU was uh, our general photograph collection is the institutional photo archive for the university. There's over a million photographs, uh, they estimate, um, between prints, 35 millimeter negatives, born digital photos going back about 120 years. We have about 20,000 digitized or ingested so far, um, but precisely none of them have been put onto our uh, now very old digital collections platform. We're in the midst of migrating to a new platform, but one of the main things that was stopping getting these photos out and public and searchable was the real lack of metadata. How could we make these things findable? And I'll give you a sense of, this is kind of a problem that we were facing. Um, the collection is mostly organized uh, by the level of a single roll of film um, or for stuff in like the late 90s, uh, CDs that we get. Um, and what you see on the right hand side is sort of like a mocked up contact sheet of what we would get in a roll of negatives and the description that the photographer would have written portraits of an unidentified man slash freshman camp. Which ones are the portrait of the unidentified man? Which ones are the portrait of the freshman camp? Uh, there's nothing attached to the single item that's telling us unless a human being is looking at it and then it's obvious. So we couldn't just inherit copy and paste all these container level info onto the items. 
And to get all of that item level metadata in manually would be the amount of labor that we simply couldn't do. So uh, what was the summer project for this initiative? Um, a prototype implementation of a system and a user interface that would not replace our archivists with computer vision, but instead give them a user interface that had just enough sort of sprinkling of computer vision sugar on it that would help them to quickly pull up similar photos and class them together. Um, we have an output that was a white paper reporting on the effectiveness of a bunch of methods, similarity search, duplicate detecting, uh, tagging at scale, even testing out object detection with Google Vision. Spoiler alert, it's terrible. Um, but then also some production requirements. Uh, what would the system look like if we were going to do this for real? Um, so I'll just give you a hint of some of the results that we got out of this. Um, here's one of those lovely uh, Tizni, or I think this was a UMAP uh, cloud of those photos in visual space. Um, we did feature detection using off-the-shelf models, um, and I'm happy to chat more about that uh, in Slack or in questions afterwards. Um, again, we weren't using these models to create labels for these photos. We we're using them to say, cluster my photos together, which ones are close together in a similar space to each other. Um, these off-the-shelf models aren't perfect for this collection. Uh, it's primarily black and white photos, historical photographs, and we talk about that more in the paper. But uh, it got us close enough to get pretty effective visual search. Um, here's an example of this. Uh, up in the upper left-hand corner is a picture of our College of Fine Arts building. And here are all the photos that we could get out of a search result. A bunch of them, as you can tell, are from the same roll of film, but others are from different parts of the shoot, and some of them are completely different years, which is exactly what we needed. This was step one. Step two was then building out an interactive user interface for our archivists to experiment how would we use visual search, not just to locate photos, but to actually then apply some textual metadata, apply some tagging at scale. Um, and so this is what we mocked up. Um, using the existing metadata that we had, those kind of very broad labels uh, inherited from that role of film, archivists could pull up, say, uh, I want to start with picture of commencement. And when picking an index photo, visual search would then return, here are a bunch of possible photos that look similar to this. Archivists could then flip back into that archival context. All right, show me that whole roll of film. Let me pick out which are the ones of these that were actually, say, students at commencement versus pictures of professors at commencement or uh, honorary speakers at commencement. Um, and so our interface was really to say, visual search is the start, but then comes the human eye to look through what are all the kinds of things that we need to make uh, pulling in that archival context and not forgetting that. So uh, I invite you to check out um, the full white paper that we have where we talk about uh, the ups and the downs of this, what worked, what didn't, um, what we learned from an archival standpoint, what we learned from a kind of UI standpoint. Also a lot of important considerations about computer vision itself, what are good things to do with it, uh, what are bad things to do with it. Um, and we also have sample code. Again, this is not a production system. It's completely an alpha test, but you can get an idea of where we're going with it. So I am uh, happy to answer questions uh, in Slack or hit me up there. Um, and I think Julia Corin may also be on uh, if you have questions about the archive. Uh, and so thank you. Thank you, Matt. Uh, OK, the screen has stopped sharing. Um, now our uh, next speaker uh, will be Carrie Gordon, who will give an Islandora update. Take it away, Carrie. Ah, there we go. Uh, thank you. Uh, this is going to be a remarkably unvisual overview of where Islandora is right now. Uh, Islandora, is, uh, as most of you know, is, is a digital asset management system built for libraries. Islandora started in 2006, integrating Drupal, Fedora, and Solar through uh, custom software. Uh, built by three developers at the University of Prince Edward Island. Uh, through Islandora 7, it uses Drupal mostly for Chrome and ephemeral content, and the display is still driven by Fedora. And Fedora is the set, was or is the center of the Islandora universe up till then. Uh, and Drupal modules were used, but they were 
really just wrappers for Island or custom code. Uh, dozens of developers, 331 known installation. Uh, it's grown quite a bit since then. Uh, although through seven, it is basically the same approach. Uh, also, in the last couple of years, Isle, which is was called Islandora for everyone, is now Islandora Enterprise, uh, recycling the uh, acronym, uh, began as a consortia of Eastern colleges, uh, used Docker as the way to Mount Islandora, which lessened the te technical debt, and it was built largely with a by a company called Born Digital. Um, before then, I mean, originally it had uh, installing uh, installing Islandora was uh, quite a process, but then uh, in the last few years, using Ansible to build it, which simplified it a lot. Moving to Docker helps even a lot more. Uh, Islandora 8 is a complete rewrite. It's centered on uh, Drupal 8 and 9 and a bevy of microservices, micro not Microsoft, microservices. It supports, but it doesn't need Fedora 6. Uh, let's, let's throw this up. So that's pretty much the microservice map. And uh, at the beginning of the chat, today's chat, I put links to the documentation where you can find this chart of explanation of what the latest version of Islandora, Islandora 8 is doing and uh, some links to the, uh, to the alpha code for uh, mounting this in, uh, in Docker. So, you know, it doesn't need Fedora 6. It can use it, simple systems that don't need that pre level of preservation and metadata tooling can be just built in Drupal. And uh, it also features things like you can build it in Drupal and use an outside uh, storage mechanism like S3 directly. It can still be, be built in Ansible, but the recommended path going forward is going to be through IL container-based and then Docker for now. Uh, the, new the new IL install is in alpha right now. It's got 27 Docker images. So we're trying to uh, narrow that down a little. Uh, it's, uh, it's the development of Islandora has uh, been supported heavily by uh, Laracis Discovery Garden Born Digital and uh, to some degree, my company, Cherry Hill. Uh, I just wanted to make this quick and that's pretty much it. Ask any questions you like uh, and um, give it a try. Thank you, Carrie. Um, just a, a reminder, uh, there were two questions that are that were put in Whova um, that were for Matt. Um, please do make sure you include their name. I think it was clear that it was for him. But uh, for, for any future questions, put the name of the speaker. Uh, thank you for your presentation. And our next speaker is Ryushi Yoshimoto, who um, will introduce an open book camera version one, a DIY camera for pictures of books. Uh, take it away. Video stopped. Yeah, uh, I hear you. Ah, okay. And now we see you. <laughs> okay. Ah, uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm nervous, so I'm not good English. So let's try. Uh, hello, everyone. I, I'm Ryuji from Japan. Uh, I introduce uh, Open Book Camera version one. Uh, so uh, I am a web engineer in Japan and uh, operate several libraries, web service, uh, OPAX and discovery service. Uh, and yeah. So uh, 
I won't show the book spine in Opax and any web service. Uh, so the uh, book cover image is uh, provided by commercial data and apps. So, but uh, spine image data is no data. So nothing. So uh, I won't take pictures uh, more fast for uh, spine pictures. Uh, so book. So I tried between uh, between uh, summer vacation uh, to, uh, tried uh, developing the camera for uh, books. So three year uh, between summer vacation. Uh, so many way to shoot, shoot uh, books by camera. Uh, so uh, completed in uh, uh, this is completed. So this is an open book camera version one. So this camera is uh, three size, uh, 50 books per minute. Uh, so uh, take three shot uh, is uh, top, bottom, and side. Uh, and go same time read backwards. Uh, so this is uh, four four second to shot uh, one book. So uh, put the book and automatic exposure. So uh, three files, uh, same folder, same same pass uh, store. Okay. So this is open hardware and open soft, uh, open source software. Uh, so uh, all design and code are provided under CC zero. So uh, this is uh, placed in GitHub. And uh, as possible, uh, commodity parts sold as, uh, uh, from Amazon or yes, uh, USB camera, Arduino, uh, Python, OpenCV. So this is architecture of open book camera. Uh, but this is uh, computer and control uh, light and uh, sensors and books detector and uh, book thickness detector. So top camera is focus controlled. Uh, I make 40 camera at the uh, build uh, at home. So many camera. Uh, this camera is a little bit flash. So I assembled the body camera uh, kit uh, uh, assembled. I've now tested in uh, personal use and special library, uh, public library and bookstore in Bastila. So uh, special library in Tokyo uh, tried automatic cataloging with uh, OCR, uh, Google Vision API. So I, I tried, now I planning uh, develop version two. So make it together if interest, thank you. Thank you very, very much. Uh, our next speaker is Carolyn Cole who is going to talk about deploying everything with Capistrano. <laughs> Go ahead, Carolyn. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, so yeah, deploy everything with Capistrano. It sounds a little crazy. Um, whoops. 
Uh, and so, you know, I wanted to just take a step back and say, you know, where do good ideas come from? And per my usual, uh, this one came from a conversation. Most ideas are, sometimes they're conversations with yourself, but uh, most of the time they're conversations with others. It kind of gives you a different perspective. You know, your head is down and maybe when you look up, you can get a good idea. Uh, so the conversation was a little bit like this. Uh, Francis and Esme were in a, and I were in a room and I went, oh, I hate this thing that I've done. I created this Ansible role. I wanted it to deploy my code. Using the whole role was really bad because it had to look and rebuild the whole server. So I created a separate role. That's still slow. I'm the only one on my team that can do it. Um, and it's stored separately from the source code. And Francis goes to me, Carolyn, why aren't you deploying this with Capistrano? And my first reaction was, what the heck? This is Drupal code. Why would I ever deploy it with Capistrano? Capistrano was a Ruby app. And I said, well, I'm just going to stick with Ansible for now. And, and that just rankled in my head for the longest time. And I said, why not try it? So I picked a tiny app. I picked a PHP application. And then I, I did a few things. I created a gem file, tiny little file. It's not that much to maintain. All right. I ran bundle install. I ran bundle exec cap install. That's the instructions from Capistrano. Not hard. I then went in and added my servers. And then I pointed it at my code base. Said a few things like where to deploy it to. And, and then I did one little thing which was really a little bit weird, not Ruby-ish, which was PHP has an environment. So I linked it in. But you know, Capistrano has all of these lovely after. So that wasn't even really that hard. And so my mind was blown. I'm like, whoa, wait a second. Can I really deploy everything with Capistrano? It was so easy. So then I thought, oh, let me just try something else. And I will tell you that Drupal 7, Drupal 8, Drupal 9, they're not quite as easy. There's a lot more configuration. There's some attaching with solar. There's playing with stuff. But it really wasn't that hard. Uh, the thing that we now have is that even though I have to maintain Ruby applications, Drupal applications, PHP applications, Class 3 applications, no matter what code I'm working on, I can deploy it the same way. So if I have an update, and usually my updates to these applications are when something has gone horribly wrong, I don't really have to think that hard. I just say, oh yeah, cap deploy, awesome. The one thing I haven't gotten is Princeton has a uh, Slack integration with Hubot. And so I would like to be able to deploy them with that. I haven't quite gotten that to work yet. But I mean, it was incredibly easy. And I, I would never go back. So that's my whole talk. Uh, there's URLs. I put the URL in Slack for the, the chat. If you want to look at things, I'm happy to answer any questions. But thank you, Francis, for ask me, asking me that question. That's me. Great. Thank you, Carolyn. Um, we have one more scheduled talk lined up, um, but we still have about 25 minutes left in this session. So if anyone has been inspired by what you've heard right now and have something that you want to share with the community, it doesn't have to be anything formal with slides or presentation, uh, like uh, a more formal uh, PowerPoint. You can uh, you know, raise your hand in the Slack, or sorry, raise your hand in Zoom or reach out to us in Slack uh, or on Whova, and, and we can uh, promote you to a panelist and, and you can get a chance uh, to speak to the, to the group, even if it's just a, a brief uh, thing you want to say. 
Um, and we'll also use the, the remaining time to make sure that uh, any questions that have been asked of our present presenters are addressed. Um, we do have uh, one that's uh, addressed to Carrie but hasn't been answered yet. Uh, and, and it looks like we are getting responses uh, on the one that was asked to Ryushi. So uh, good job, everyone. Uh, but without further ado, I will introduce our next speaker, um, Eric Pettiplace, who will talk about Mrs. Mark and learning from Code for Live. Go ahead, Eric. Hello, everybody. Let me get my machine screen sharing started here. Um, so this is actually just a redo of a talk that our cataloger gave last week. Um, I encouraged her to create a lightning talk about a critical cataloging project that we had that actually came out of work from Code for Lib. Um, and so our cataloger is Amber Bales. Um, there's her picture. She threw the pictures of other staff in here. So I feel like she deserves a shout out. Um, so in the upper left, that's her, and she gave this at um, Skelk Colloquium, which is a local California consortium um, last week. And basically, uh, the project was identifying um, biased or in antiquated descriptions um, in name fields of our metadata. It was a, a problem that was originally brought to our attention by Janine Scarborough, our archives technician. Um, and she had noticed it with regards to the wives of our trustees at California College of the Arts, which was formerly California College of the Arts and Crafts, so CCAC. But you can see the caption over on the right of this image says CCAC trustee, Mrs. Charlie Henry Hine left and Mrs. Albert G. Churchill, wife of a trustee, et cetera. Um, spoilers, uh, their names are not actually Albert and Charles, they have their own names, but in lots of older records, um, women were described this way. They were referred to as their husband's name, even when they were the author or creator of a work, for instance, in Mark records. Um, so this was something that we had been aware of and had seen a lot in our um, records. But then in 2019, um, Noah Garachi gave a Code for Lib talk, Programmatic Approaches to Bias and Descriptive Metadata that I found to be really great and um, highlighting a lot more than just this issue, but specifically producing a tool um, to analyze uh, names and sort of guess whether or not this sort of Mrs. Husband's name construction um, existed. So really quickly, just looking at that, this is the, the talk um, uh, abstract, and there is a recording also linked to in the slides here of the talk if you wanna go look at it. And Noah um, in this script kind of notes the complexity of names and how this is a uh, approximate approach, right? So gender is not a property of a name. You can't just look at a name and know the gender of a person, which is why the tool used is called gender guesser, right? So it's always approximate and it always takes some kind of human intervention and analysis to determine what's going on. Um, but this tool uh, does a really good job of just trying to approximate where there are biased descriptions. And uh, all I did was very little. I just stitched it together. Let me refresh. This is more readable. I think the white is a lot more readable. I just stitched it together with um, PyMark, essentially. So the tool is generic. It's not meant to analyze any particular uh, type of metadata. It's a, a text analysis tool. Um, but you can simply iterate over all the non-control fields in Mark was all I did, looking for these constructions and printing them out. Um, and then I compiled them into a spreadsheet um, where we, can, we could walk through them one by one, um, do some research and some analysis. Sometimes uh, nothing was wrong. And the, the, you know, the gender guesser simply had been inaccurate. Other times uh, there was the correct name in the right form somewhere in the record. And a lot of the times we had to do research um, utilizing primarily like LC authority records since these are bibliographic records, right? Um, so that should be good a lot of the times, but oftentimes that wasn't enough. And you can see there's some WorldCat links, Wikipedia, 
Uh, there's a Trove link in here. So all sorts of different sources to try and determine the uh, actual name of these creators, these authors, or people being referenced in works. Um, and for a few of them, I think it was only like two out of some 50, uh, we actually could not find the actual uh, correct name form. Uh, this is part of a few um, sort of critical cataloging and metadata practices that we're trying to undergo at California College of the Arts. And we're inspired by uh, projects like Archives for Black Lives, uh, which is linked here, that is a series of anti-racist description resources, um, particularly for people at predominantly white institutions like ours, uh, where most of our employees are white in the libraries. This is really important um, work for us, especially because we do end up describing materials that are you know, by people who are not white, by minorities. And um, the cataloging lab is another um, really valuable and inspirational resource for us that sort of introduces new subject headings, keep track of subject heading changes. Um, specifically, one thing we've been engaged in is uh, we have migrated away from the illegal aliens subject heading to undocumented immigrants. Um, there's a great documentary on this that people might be familiar with, where basically the Library of Congress wanted to make this change and Congress blocked it and, and politicized it. Um, so that's something that we do and that does take like quite a bit of work and, and manual maintenance on our part, but it's important to us. And we, as a uh, library, all watched this documentary and sort of discussed this and, and other similar issues and places where we can make our metadata less biased. And I think I posted the link to these slides, but there's a few useful embedded links in there, like to uh, Noah's talk from 2019. And thank you very much. Okay, uh, thank you, Eric. So uh, that does uh, conclude all of the scheduled speakers for today. So um, before we do break, I do want to give us a few minutes to, since we do have all of the, the speakers available for, for any, to give any um, answers to any more questions you have from the talks, um, please do um, put in any questions you may have in the chat or the Q&A, and, uh, and then and we can get those answers maybe even live. Okay, I do see a question here from Sarah Hammerman. Hi, Sarah. Uh, are there any instances, in, and this is for Eric, are there any instances in which this tool could be used to identify authorized LCSH with uh, Mrs. Husband in the heading and work to revise those headings? Yeah, that's a, a great question. I absolutely think you could. Um, iterating over the entirety of like LCSH or the Library of Congress authority headings would probably take quite a long time, but I have no doubt that you would find a lot of them. Um, just anecdotally from the instances that we saw, most of uh, the LC authority records um, did refer to women by their own name and they might have an alternate access point um, in like a, like, what is that? Like a 700 field or something um, for uh, other constructions like Mrs. Uh, Mrs. Um, husband's name. So mostly the problems were with our catalog and not with LC, but absolutely, I think that would be a, a valuable project for undertaking. Thanks. Okay, oh, another, uh, another question for you, Eric. Uh, did you meet resistance in breaking from LCSH when you changed to the undocumented immigrants heading? If so, how did you address that? Um, no, we didn't locally. Um, we're all pretty much on board with this. We have a uh, pretty progressive staff. And even though it's a little bit extra labor for us to make this change, um, everybody thought it was the, the right decision. Um, but for looking at resistance, actually, I would recommend um, watching that subject or that uh, change the subject documentary. Um, the problem kind of uh, originated at Dartmouth, right? Um, that's what the the um, documentary is about. And that kind of gives you an interesting um, look at the complexities of it and the resistance that librarians can sometimes put up. Um, yeah, um, I'm, I'm hoping I can see if I can convince one of my colleagues to, to give a lightning talk later this week about this exact subject. Um, but 
uh, I'll, I'll paste a link in the chat. If you do a, a search for undocumented immigrants in the in the Franklin catalog at Penn, um, we've introduced a, 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 an interesting approach to uh, to show preferred terms, like to, to still preserve the data, um, but to, to to show and 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 have the records display undocumented immigrants instead of uh, instead of illegal aliens. Uh, let's see any more questions okay uh another one for you eric uh could deliberately altering mrs husband's last name also be considered a form of dead naming um i honestly am not informed enough to answer that question um all i can say is that it does speak to the complexities of names also um it is somewhat of an assumption that uh, people want to go by their own names. Um, one thing that we came across in our research was that um, Black women for a while uh, wanted to be referred to by their husband's name because for a while, Black people weren't allowed to marry, right? Like in America, literally we repressed that. So there was a, a sort of point of pride to it. I think most of, most if not all of the records um, were for like, Anglo-Saxon women um, that we were correcting. So we felt pretty comfortable in doing that. Um, but that's certainly a, a point that we'll have to look into more. OK, um, thank you for answering these questions. Um, and I've, I, anything that we haven't uh, already talked about, um, we can continue to discuss in Slack later. Um, because I think, oh, no, another question for you, Eric. Uh, not a question about the technology. I really like that you all watched and discussed change the subject, and I think we might want to do something similar here. Was that part of an existing staff de development structure? Um, yes and no. Um, kind of just with the Black Lives Matter protests, our administration is trying to be um, more thoughtful and actually like, materially invested in um, change and progressive uh, projects like what we're working on. So we set aside Juneteenth um, to everybody read and research and sort of look into things that you wanted to apply in your work. And we had just a um, an hour set aside where all the, this is actually during 2020, so we were working remotely. We all got together and watched virtually the the um, documentary. So it will become something that is a recurring annual project, but it only just started this year. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, so it, it looks like I just did get a, uh, a, a, a message in here for, uh, for, for, for uh, uh, I guess, uh, Carrie, uh, I think, can uh, also do a quick minute uh, or two uh, about OBS. So I will uh, pass off the the microphone to him and uh, and uh, yeah we do have if, if someone still wants to, to join in we, we do have uh, 10 minutes left in this session okay uh, one second here I'm almost there okay so OBS oh, yeah. so uh, there are whoops I just blew this whole thing, sorry. Uh, there are a number of people who are using OBS, uh, running their video through OBS. And uh, let me start my video. There we go. Okay, so the number of people who are you using OBS, and I use it. Uh, I started using it when uh, our co chair, my co chair friend, and uh, sometimes co worker. Uh, Peter Murray, I saw that he had a uh, index data logo in the corner of his videos. I said, well, that looks cool. And he, so he said, oh, yes. Yeah. So uh, let me just give you a screen share. Uh, find, let me find it here. I only have 4,000 windows open. Uh, it's in here somewhere. Damn, here it goes. Sorry, I have to do something here. 
This is taking amazingly long, sorry. This is totally impromptu, yes. So, okay, so that should work. So screen sharing, I'm still not screen sharing. Let me try again. Okay, well, this is screwed up because it says I have to allow screen sharing for OBS and I have, and it's still not showing up. So anyway, this is this this is a, a failure. Maybe I can show my entire screen and just make this bigger. I'll try one more time. Yep, uh, Zoom is not letting me uh, share my screen in any way, shape, or form. So anyway. Uh, this would have been interesting and maybe I'll try to put it together for later, uh, but right now it's a complete fail uh, because I can't really show you what I'm doing. So I tried, try to come up with something. Sorry about that experience, Kara, but yeah, as, as uh, I said earlier in the, uh, in the session, there are still slots available. Uh, yeah. Wednesday, tomorrow at 3 p.m. and uh, Thursday at 1, 10 p.m. Uh, do sign up. Um, and I guess okay, I... Okay. I will just take a quick look to make sure not, uh, well, I, I think we've uh, addressed everything. I don't see any new questions. And so uh, with that, I think we'll end the session a few minutes early. The, the, the next session uh, will be in a, in a separate Whova um, session and we'll start at 1.05. Uh, so thank you all very much.